everybody. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. I'm Thomas Shane, and uh, today we're joined by Corey Hastings as our guest. And you can find us on YouTube on Monday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern at youtube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy. And you can uh, find us with the full taping on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, and uh, you know we take the whole live show, edit it down, put up graphics, and we uh, put it up to Voluntary Virtues, user uh, YouTube.com/user/VoluntaryVirtues. So, uh, what would you like to talk about today, Thomas? Okay, well, uh, today, like I said, we got Corey Hastings joining us, and he is a big. Uh, First of all, he, he is an anarchist. I've known him for, you know, I've been uh, communicating with him for almost a year now, so we've, you know, we're, we're, we're friends. Uh, he is an anarchist. I am an anarchist. That's how we met in the first place. But uh, uh, Corey enjoys supporting uh, Justin Amash. Uh, he is from, Corey's from Michigan, so he, he supports Amash. Uh, for Congress. You, you voted for him, am I correct, Corey? Did you vote? Or? Yes, I, I voted for him in the primary and I plan to vote for him in November in the uh, yeah. in the general election and I still have his sign posted outside of my yard. It's going to stay there until the election is over. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, so Corey, you're, you're an anarchist, right? Yes. So, so we're going to talk a little bit today about basically how, uh, uh, basically about anarchists you know, supporting a stateless society, but also supporting uh, politicians and kind of uh, um, the the logical that that backs that up. So you know, a lot of a lot of politicians. I, I get it. A lot of politicians. Like I, I like I like Ron Paul. I know he's not a he's not a politician anymore, um, but I like Ron Paul not as a politician, but just as an individual and a lot of the things that he says. I just agree with a lot of what he says. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about a mosh, but uh, like Gary Johnson, I know quite a bit about, and I, you know, I agree with what he says too, and I agree with their principles and stuff. It's just where I, where I have a bit of a conflict is being an anarchist and supporting a politician, uh, and I understand the lot. Like I said, I understand the logical of where it comes from and why a lot of people get behind that because. You know, a libertarian politician is, you know, better than a Democrat or a Republican politician because, um, you know, their po their policies are more likely to to vote for legislation that doesn't infringe upon people's personal liberties, that doesn't criminalize victimless activities. But I guess my whole my whole issue is that how do you how do you be an anarchist and simultaneously support uh, a politician, and do you consider that a valid strategy? As in, uh, you know, jamming up legislation or in them intentionally causing problems in Congress, or uh, using Congress using their congressional position as a soapbox to talk about important issues and and raise awareness. So uh, let's just we're going to go ahead and set that as the underlying theme of this episode is. Anarchists supporting politicians and whether or not that is a valid strategy, why and how. So, yeah. Sounds good to me. Okay, so Corey, why don't you go ahead and explain to us why, why as an anarchist, someone who is uh, opposed to government, who believes that a government is inherently uh, corrupt and uh, just bad and just not a good thing, how do, how do you come to support a politician and why? Well, basically, it's kind of everything that you just suggested. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of all of that. See, what Justin Amash does in Congress, he's a lot like Ron Paul, but in my opinion, even better than Ron Paul. Because the one thing he does that Ron Paul never did is he, he outlines and explains every single vote that he casts. And you can go on his Facebook page and look at his record and see exactly how he voted and why. And what from the, his record that I've seen so far, he uh, any time that a budget comes up or a you know a bill that's supposed to spend money on something, 
the only way that he's going to vote yes on it is if it's spending less money than the previous budget. If there's an increase in spending, it's an automatic no. If there's a decrease in spending, then it depends on what the funding is for. If it's for something like the NSA, automatic no. He introduced uh, two bills, uh, one right after the other, to defund the NSA and to shut down the NSA or at least to stop their domestic spying. Both of them bills failed. Um, right now he's he's one of the leading congressmen that's trying to demilitarize the police following up this Ferguson thing. Um, you know, uh, he's against all foreign intervention. He's against all foreign aid. Um, so, you know, the way I see it is if if everything that they're doing is to reduce the size and the scope of the government, to reduce the government's power, to reduce their influence over our lives, and to reduce their spending of our money, and to reduce their taxation theft against us, then I don't see any reason not to uh, support them. And uh, on top of that, though, if we ever do want to actually have an anarchist society, the only way to take down the government peacefully is to gradually reduce it over time, cut out the unneeded agencies like the DHS, the NSA, just completely eliminate them, and gradually over time, you know, re, uh, replace the needed services with private enterprises that would provide those services. And, you know, over a period of maybe decades, uh, eventually we could have an anarchist society if we go about it that way. Um, I guess the only alternative I see to that would be a violent overthrow of the government, which would be a massive civil war, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of people dead. I don't think anybody wants to see that, you know. Yeah, no. No, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. It's just, um, and, you know, to me personally, um, and, I, you know, I like to give you a lot of shit for this, Corey, and, you know, part, you know, most of it is just, is just, you know, satirical. I'm just giving you shit for the sake of giving you shit. But. Oh, I know. You know, we all, all of us in the libertarian movement, we all do that. Yeah, but uh, I guess my biggest thing is, you know, it's it's kind of like the it's kind of like an inner inner struggle, I guess I would uh, would describe it as because you're you're not wrong in your assumption that the, you know the obviously the most the most direct way and the path of least resistance to an anarchist society or to a free society would be through. Uh, more and more libertarian candidates and libertarian politicians and legislation um, because obviously they're going to the more libertarians you have in big government the more libertarian legislation you're going to have which is less victimless crimes and less you know government spending and that sort of thing but um, I guess for me uh, it just comes down to being an anarchist while simultaneously supporting a politician who is funded through uh, taxation, who is funded through extortion and theft. Uh, Ron Paul, including, was was funded. His his career was funded through extortion. His political career, I should should say. Well, he still is. As, as a retired congressman, he gets that pension for life. He his does. Never goes away. I didn't know that they get pensions yeah. even when they're and their their pension. Their pension is equal to 100% of their pay while in Congress. That 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 paycheck never goes away. Once elected, even if you only serve one day, and then you are thrown out of office, you get paid for life. I did not know that. Yep, that's a fact. You can look that up. So yeah, so no, I, I, I believe you. I believe you. I'm just saying it's just that's that's my whole dilemma on it is is supporting a politician because on one hand, like I say. I want to support someone who is pro individual freedom, pro property rights, anti victimless crimes, that sort of thing. But on the on the other hand, I don't agree with them being funded through taxation. That includes uh, you know, Paul, Mosh, Gary Johnson, who I did I voted for Gary Johnson the last time, who I still you know support as an individual. It's just that's that whole you know it's just a it's a conundrum to me it's a dilemma it's you know do you choose 
do you choose to support them or do you choose to oppose them? And, you know, kind of by opposing them, you're kind of just perpetuating uh, the subversion of your own belief system because if there's no libertarians in office, that means that there's Republicans and Democrats in office, and they are most certainly not what libertarians and uh, anarchists believe in. So, Or, you know, it could be even worse. We could get somebody in there that's like a... Uh, you know, Communist Party or a... Uh, oh, yeah. And there there still is a Communist Party of America, and they still do run candidates. They're just incredibly unpopular, you know. Yeah. But they are there, and they do run. Yeah. Uh, Josh, what do you have to say on this? I, I want to talk about how... Uh, if, if you have, like... Uh, if you come from a Republican or a Democratic point of view and you're finally introduced to libertarianism, like I got introduced by Ron Paul, basically. And uh, eventually, after like two, three years of that, I became an anarchist. And then I saw the contradictions. So I appreciate the fact that minarchy is in politics, but once you become an anarchist, it's kind of like you kind of have to, you know, get out of politics altogether, in my opinion, because, you, you know, you have to take the market approach and do things that we're doing, you know, like online, you know, try to spread the word the way we're doing it. Um, I wouldn't use politics at all. You know, I wouldn't have a political party because that, yeah, like you say, it, it can it completely subverts what we're trying to do here. That's that's where I'm coming from, from a basic standpoint. Um, a lot of the shit that I get from from anarchists about about supporting Justin Mosh and, you know, maybe a couple other uh, politicians to a lesser degree is most of it comes from the kind of, uh, I guess I'd say like the Christopher Cantwell crowd where they're saying, you know, well, they say they don't want to violently overthrow the government, or sometimes they do, but uh, right. I will. they don't want to support any libertarian politicians. And their their answer for me is, well, you just opt out of government. You know, you quit using it. You, but I mean, that's right. not that's not to me that's not a valid um, response because you can't opt out of government. You know, you if if a cop pulls you over on the side of the road, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm not going to submit to his authority and, you know, just put it in high gear. You right. Know, I, <laughs> you, you really can't opt out. I mean, you could go move to a cabin in the woods somewhere and hope that you stay off their radar for a while. Right. But as we recently saw a few weeks ago, I don't remember what state it was in, but there was a guy who did that. He moved way out in the woods, you know, miles from any society, built himself a little cabin out in the woods. He was raising some chickens and, you know, uh, getting his own clean water out of the river or whatever yeah. and all that. And the cops came out there with bulldozers and tore his house down. You Florida. Know? Was that in Florida? It was yeah. the guy in Florida, yeah. Wasn't it the guy they put a warrant out for his arrest because he set up traps on his own property that could hurt human beings? Um, I don't remember that. Yeah, even though it was something his, similar. It was his own property, <laughs> which you know. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Well, um, the one that I saw, it was actually on quote government property. It was public property, and uh. But, I mean, it was miles from civilization. There was nobody out there, you know? Were and, you talking about the thing in Nevada? Um, I don't... Uh, well, you might remember it by this, is um, when the police came to tear down his house, he didn't resist them or anything. He said that his only one request that he wanted was he wanted to watch them do it. Huh. Um, yeah, I don't remember that, no. Maybe you missed yeah, that. not ringing any bells. Yeah. But I mean, but, there we've got we've got three examples between three of us right there. If you go out and try yeah. to move out in the middle of the woods, they're gonna come and tear your fucking house down. Yeah. You know? So I mean, I don't know where people get this opt out thing. I mean, you can opt out as much as possible, but you're still in the system. By all, let me. Can I talk about what I'm actually doing? Because what I'm doing is I'm. 
they're going to force their rules upon me, like you're yeah. saying. Like, uh, like, for example, I just got pulled over a couple days ago just for running a red light when I didn't actually do it, but he thought he knew what he was talking about, but that's besides the point. You know, I get pulled over for traffic all this shit time, all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I never took unemployment for the last three years. I never took, uh, you know, Social Security or anything like that. You know, no benefits, quote unquote. Uh, but anytime they want to put their foot down on my neck, it, they're going to do it. So you're right. There's, there's only so much I can do. And there are people that fight these traffic things uh, for years and don't get anywhere. I'm not going to play that game. That's ridiculous. But I will go to court over this red light thing. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I don't take unemployment. Uh, I don't take any kind of benefits at all. Um, so uh, that's how I opt out, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I don't uh, like to use the system, you know, to be a user or whatever. But, um, you know, I just want people to see that there is another way. Like, you can always, you know, go find a job. That's how you don't take unemployment benefits, and that's how you keep up your integrity. You know, it's about morality more for me. You um, know what I mean? Can I say something real quick about that? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. so like I told you, Josh, just before we did this episode, that so my boss is retiring at the end of next month, um, and I might not have uh, a job anymore. And I was thinking, you know, if I if that does go through and that I don't have a job, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna immediately start looking for another job. But while I'm looking for another job, I will be taking unemployment. Uh, and my logic behind that is. By using unemployment or any or welfare or food stamps or any of the social entitlement programs, I don't I don't view that I don't view not using them as an opt out of the system. I believe that because I I'm 24 years old right now. I'll be 25 next month. I've been working pretty much full time since I was 14, and I've been paying taxes since then. And I've I've never received uh, unemployment. I I was on food stamps for about four months one time a, uh, a couple uh, years ago. So, and my, my rationale is that I've been paying taxes for over 10 years now, so by my taking unemployment, I don't consider that uh, using the system. I consider that getting something back for all of the extortion fees that I've paid. So, that's, that's my whole rationale behind that and the Social Security thing. And a lot of people also agree that Using welfare, food stamps, social security, that sort of thing is one of the best strategies because you use those systems while simultaneously. I, um, I'll, I'll also be, let me throw in here right now, me and a friend of mine who uh, uh, is a member of the, the anarchist meetup or affinity, if you like, group that I've started in the, in the Portland, Washington area. Uh, we're changing our exemption so that we will no longer uh, be paying taxes. So uh, we're not paying taxes anymore. So that by using the systems while simultaneously not paying taxes is bleeding the system. So to bleed all that, bleed the system, and to bleed all that funding is actually in our rationale. And my, I keep saying in my rationale, my opinion, because you might, you guys might disagree, or somebody watching this might disagree, and that's fine too because everybody has their opinion. Um, it's basically a way of bleeding, you know, draining the system to just take away as much funding from that as you possibly can without providing any back. So that's my provision, or that's my, my perception. Here. Well, my, my opinion, though, on the, on the taking welfare and all that is it's true that, you know, if you've worked, you know, your, at least most of your life, you've paid into all that, and you are entitled to getting something back. And this is what one thing I don't like about you know, especially the uh, mainline Republican Party, is they talk about people using entitlements like it's a bad thing. They use the word entitlements like it's almost like a cuss word, you know. But the fact is you are entitled. When you've paid thousands of dollars into the system and something comes up where you need one of these programs to get off your feet or something, you are entitled to it. And entitled is not a bad word. Entitled means you owe me this. I paid, now you owe me. You know? 
That's the problem, though. That's that's a exact problem. What's that, Josh? You're forced to pay that into that system, so you you feel entitled to it. You know what I'm saying? But it's real entitlement. Like, it's not a trade. You know what I'm saying? It's not. It's not in the market. What's going on? You know? Does that make any sense? Yeah, well, but I, I wasn't quite finished there. I was going to get into that, and I was going to say, right. you know, what you said, because yeah. you're not voluntarily paying it. You know, it's being stolen right. from. So that'd be like if somebody comes up to you on the street with a gun, steals $100 from you, and then, you know, a couple years later, you go and knock on his door and be like, hey, remember that $100? You think I could get a new TV? You know? Yeah. Hey, Josh, you said you couldn't hear me earlier. Yeah, you're breaking up. So you didn't hear really what I said? Uh, for the most part, I think we did. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what I was talking about. Is I, I, if I, if I'm 24 now, I'll be 25 next month. I've been paying taxes since I was 14 years old. That's almost 11 years of paying taxes in which I've, I've received very little, uh, in, you know, I've received very little in return for that. Uh, as I said, I've never taken unemployment. I've never taken student loans. I've, I've taken food stamps for about four months a couple of years ago. So yeah, as, uh, as uh, Corey was putting it, I agree perfectly that it's, you know, it's an entitlement. I've been paying for this, you know, I've been paying for so long, so you owe me something. And that, that was my whole strategy behind it was uh, basically a lot of people believe that to be a strategy for uh, bleeding government funding, is bleeding the system, taking as much out of it as you can while simultaneously putting nothing back into it. So that was my whole basic point in case you didn't catch that. Right. The, um, the main thing that I disagree with on that point, though, is mm -hmm. that you're bleeding the system. Because mm -hmm. in reality, you're not bleeding the system. Because what they're going to do is when, once too many people get on those entitlement programs and the government can't afford it anymore, they're just going to raise taxes on everybody again. So there's kind of there's kind of two sides of that coin, you know. On the one hand, uh, you did pay into it. Something is owed to you. On the other hand, the more people that get on it, they'll just increase taxes on everybody. Yeah. The first one I did, I seen all seven people. And I said, okay, so what am I doing? Let me, uh, Thomas, you, you've got a lot of background noise going on here. Hold uh, on. So, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go over the prices real quick. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to test to see if this actually. At uh, the uh, prices today were taken at 8.45, so uh, please check this out. See if this works. Silver, uh, silver has from uh, twenty dollars and two cents to nineteen dollars sixty two cents. That's a forty. Uh, has. Only dropped about ten dollars, uh, thirteen oh seven twenty six last time, twelve ninety seven seventy two this time, so that's about a nine dollar fifty cent drop. Bitcoin has changed uh, uh, drastically. <laughs> it's a twenty percent drop from five hundred seventy dollars three cents last time to four hundred fifty three dollars fifty nine cents about forty five minutes ago. So that's about that. So, uh, we're back. Uh, see if I can get this right. Here we go. So, um, anyway, beyond that, uh, what else were we talking about earlier? Uh, we were going to talk about something else. All the riots, I believe. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, that's a big topic over the last couple of days. I guess we might as well cover that a little bit, you know? All right. uh, yeah, I agree. Um, first off, the Ferguson thing... I, I keep on hearing about this Louisville uh, purge. It sounded like a hoax, I guess. 
Yeah. But um, I guess yeah, the I police are taking it very seriously. Yeah, I mean they should probably. Of course. But, Hopefully it's a hoax, but uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, this Missouri thing, um, I I think it's gone a little bit out of hand. Uh, it sounds like it's it's kind of become like a like a party in a way. Uh, like you, you, you know, some guy, some policeman shot a uh, a kid, and then they specified it as a black kid and a white man. Um, I think that's where the problem is because any police officer that shoots a kid is a problem. You know, it doesn't matter what what the color is. You know, that's that's what my problem is really. But um, well, another thing is though, when when the story first broke, nobody even knew who the cop was, so they had no way of knowing if it was oh, yeah. a white cop, but they immediately said it was a white cop without even knowing. <laughs> of course. And this is another thing, though, is is just like the Trayvon thing. They refer to him as a kid. He was 17 years old, 6 foot 4, and almost 300 pounds. And they refer oh, to him that. as a kid. Well, you know, like he's oh. a little 11-year-old. The original thing I heard was that he was 14 years old. Originally, I heard he was 14 years old, uh, and he was, um, what was it? Oh, he was so, he was such a gentle giant that he didn't even want to play football because he didn't want to have to tackle people and hurt them. That was the original thing that I heard. Yep. I heard a lot of that. I heard 11-year-old. Turned out not to be 11-year-old. It went Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> I heard a 2-year-old. <laughs> wouldn't doubt it. It's just amazing how it's amazing all the misinformation that surrounds every single thing like this, and it just it's like you don't need the misinformation to to bring it to light. You just need to be to be honest about it because when you're spreading misinformation about it, you're just going to put people off. You're going to make people think that it's not real, that it's not genuine or authentic, and that there's nothing for them to be concerned about. What you ought to be saying is, look, this was at what was the 18. Uh, he was 17. This was a 17-year-old boy who may or may have not have committed a robbery, but still, um, he was unarmed. Where was, his, where was his trial? Where was where was any of that? Where was his where was his trial? How how is it that you, a 17-year-old, may or may not have committed a robbery? Therefore, he deserves to be executed in the street by a police officer. That's and and even if he was uh, attempting to attack or assault the police officer, why was the cop not able to use a taser to subdue him? And if he needed to, he could keep the guy on the taser, and if he moves, just pull the trigger again and call him back up, you know? I mean, you don't you know, need to automatically assault, resort to lethal force all the time. I wouldn't even use a taser, but... Well, with a guy that big, I'd use a taser for sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, true. If he, was, if he was getting violent, yeah, definitely. But you know, when I heard eleven-year-old, you know, why would you lose use a taser? You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a seventeen-year plus, yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. But then another thing that really gets me about these, like the Trayvon Martin case, and then this one, is. Why is it that every time the media hypes up one of these stories and blows it completely out of proportion like this, it always turns out in the end that the guy was attacking someone or he was in the in the act of committing a crime and they hype it up like he's some innocent little kid. But then you've got cases like in New York where the cops recently choked this guy to death because they suspected that he might be selling cigarettes uh, so therefore he gets an automatic death sentence with no trial. The media has nothing to say about it. Or like Kelly Thomas beaten to death over a course of like a half an hour while he's begging for his life. The media has nothing to say about it. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Why don't Why don't they bring up one of those cases if they want to? You know, if they want to really, you know, put this this That's police brutality in the spotlight. It'd be perfect to put one of those cases in the media, but they don't. That's my biggest thing is because I don't honestly believe that they care about putting police brutality in the spotlight. Otherwise, they would be 
if the me if the mainstream media honestly cared about putting police brutality in the spotlight, that's all they would be reporting on. 24 hours a day, they would re be reporting on police brutality, government corruption, and abuse of authority. I yep. think that what was driven behind this was all the racial tension that was behind it because they yep. want to further, you know, they want to further divide us from each other. They want us to make it. They want to make us think that, um, you know, it's just another racial divisive measure. It's just they, yeah, they just want to divide us. They want to keep people separated. They want to keep people angry and pointing fingers at each other instead. Because if we're all pointing fingers at each other, we're not pointing fingers at them. But at the same time, though, they want to hype that racial tension. At the same time, they don't want to highlight the actual police brutality because if they wanted to highlight the actual police brutality, they wouldn't always be hyping these stories where the guy actually is a criminal, you know? I mean, there's plenty of stories out there, even of a white cop killing a black guy, where the guy actually is innocent. But they never bring those cases up. They always bring up the case where the guy turns out to be a criminal in the end. You know? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that way they can they can make it sound like they're reporting police brutality, and then a couple days later when the story comes out, they're like, oh, well, no, it turns out he was actually a thug, and the cop actually was defending himself. <laughs> you know? So, well, we can, you know, we can say it's racism, but it's not police brutality, though. You know? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm going to say right now, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let my ideology get in the way of making a logical assumption about this, but if he really was attacking or assaulting that officer and that, didn't that officer go in by himself? So he was alone. Yeah. yeah. So if he really was assaulting or attacking that police officer, I believe he had, that officer had every right to defend himself, but the bottom line is we don't really know what happened. There's only There were only two people that knew what really happened. One of them's dead, and one of them is a police officer. And that, well, doesn't, was a that doesn't bring a lot of honesty for me in my perspective. That does, I, don't, I honestly don't know what to think about that. Well, there, um, there, was, there was a witness. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mike, Mike Brown's friend was there and witnessed it. And from what he said, um, a lot of what he said has corroborated with the officer's story that uh, Mike Brown was attacking the cop. And then um, there, there was a, the story that um, he was uh, he was rushing the officer when the officer shot. And if you look at the way that his body's laying on the ground, it's like he fell forward, like he had forward momentum going. So I mean. That kind of does add up to it, but yeah. I mean, I just don't understand why would he rush the cop when the cop had his gun drawn, though, unless he was on some crazy drugs or something. I'd like to see a toxicology report on that guy, you know. And I don't mean marijuana. Well, there must have <laughs> there must have been something else going on, some kind of action, some kind of reason, you know, like nobody would actually dive into a gun. Yeah. Uh, whether whether they're on drugs or not, I, I don't believe that. Well, if they were on PCP or something, you know. That was the assumption that he was on PCP. Right. Ah. I mean, that that PCP well, that will make. Still, I still don't see how that, I, I still don't see how someone being on PCP is a death sentence, but you know. Well, I mean, if he's on PCP and attacks you. I yeah, mean, I mean, I would have PCP to our soldiers in Vietnam, so they would just go all Rambo style crazy, run out in the middle of the gunfire, and start spraying their machine gun everywhere because they didn't care. Yeah, yeah I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna sit here and lie or pretend that I wouldn't have done the same thing or that that man doesn't have the right to defend himself because he's a police officer. I'm just saying that it's, you know, it's 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 there's a lot of gray area with these issues because of. You know, he can own that officer who's who's in question right now can really only blame this on the other accounts of police brutality and all the corruption and dishonesty among police officers because they do this kind of shit so often they lie about it and they fabricate stories and they fabricate justification yeah. uh, until they're blue in the face and it's like there's no when there's no more honesty in law enforcement uh, how do you believe when it really was a matter of life and death for that officer 
versus yep. when it was just a power trip or when it was an opportunity for him uh, to kill someone and get a two-week paid vacation. He can only blame law enforcement for this, really. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not defending the officer, per se. You know, what I'm saying is, you know, from the reports that I've seen coming out, the recent reports, is, you know, the story that Mike Brown was standing there and had his hands up and was shot in the back, that was a lie. We know that was a lie now. The coroner's report shows that he was he was shot six times from the front. Um, you know, pretty much everything that has come out from, you know, the people objecting to it, Everything they said has turned out to be a lie so far. They said that it wasn't him in the robbery. Turned out it was. Even his friend said it was. They said that uh, he, he had his hands up, and it turns out that was a lie. Uh, they said he was this innocent little kid. That was a lie. You know? Mm. Right. So, I mean, the more and more that it turns out everything they're saying about him was a lie, the more I believe the cop, you know? But that still I think, doesn't justify lethal force necessarily. You know, why couldn't he use a stun gun? Yeah. Well, I'm, my thing is, why do they have to beat it into us as well? I mean, yeah. they made it so hyped up. They it's turned into a propaganda thing, just like uh, 9/11 or the yeah. Boston Mar Marathon thing or um, Stony Brook or whatever. Uh, it, it's it's always my my thing is the more they talk about it, the more they want to bury it into you that the lie is the truth, yeah. you know, because um, they're just now um, having court trials for that uh, guy at the uh, marathon massacre, yeah, and uh, you know it. They want to instill the fear that yeah he's the bad guy, but how do you know, you know, until you have the trial. You know, but you shoot the other guy, uh, you know, and you, you, you know, shut down all of Boston, you know, f for this, what, two guys, you know. Rolling I mean? through the streets and tanks, pointing machine guns at people looking out the windows and kicking in everybody's yeah. door, dragging them and their kids out yeah. of the house, searching door by door to door, oh. searching, every, you know, just full on martial law. Yeah. It was martial law, and a lot of people. I, and my thing is, I, I live very close to here, or to uh, you know Boston, and uh, I know a lot of people that were shut in, and uh, they were like, "Good, I, I'd rather be shut in." I'm like, "What? You're t you're willingly giving up your freedom for a whole day? Why? You know, like it, it's two people. You know, it, you're you have like five." Um, Five police departments, local police departments, going after these people. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and you're shutting down all of Boston. It's unbelievable. It, it was, uh, and uh, you know, people defending this, and um, it's almost like, uh, you know, what? Um, just before that, that that was April of uh, two years ago, I guess, or a year ago, or something, and um, the winter before that. There was a big snowstorm, and the government, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, called a state of emergency over snow. It's the first time it's ever happened in Massachusetts, and I'm sure it's the first time it's ever happened in the contiguous states. At least well, I think it, it must it be. It happened before in the southern states where they don't get snow. Right, but that's just fear. You know, that's the whole point. It's fear. It's just snow. <laughs> you know, like, it's unbelievable to me. Like, they shut down. It was like they were prepping for the marathon. That's what I'm getting at. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, I guess I went on a tangent, but the, what I'm trying to get at is they, you know, instill that propaganda, get you to fear uh, what's going on uh, down in Missouri. And you know, I don't know. It's That's what I was trying to get at. Um, you know, another thing about the situation in Missouri um, uh, you know, they're saying uh, one of the most recent stories I heard coming out there is the governor is calling in the Missouri militia to right. uh, no, not the Missouri militia, the, Mil the Missouri Coast National Guard, Guard yeah. to uh, to get the situation under control. And yeah. all these, you know, all these protesters and all the people supporting them, they're like, yeah, the the National Guard is going to come in and get those cops under control. 
are you fucking kidding me? You think they're going to come in there to get the cops under control? They're going to come in there and start beating the shit out of protesters, you know, machine gunning you with rubber bullets, if not real bullets. They're going to be driving tanks and herding you into a corner somewhere and start bombarding you with those LRAD cannons. And, you know, they're going to put your ass in your place. They're not going to get, they're not coming in to get the cops under control. Nobody even said that. He said they're sending in the National Guard to quell the unrest. And these right. people think they're coming in to help them. No. Yeah. yeah. That's the, when they say quell the unrest, they don't mean to get the police under control. Not at all. That's the exact opposite of what they're going to do. No, they mean to come in and fuck up protesters. Yeah, and, the, and these people are cheering it on. They're like, yeah, bring the National Guard. They're going to yeah. come and save us. Like, the National Guard cares about, you know, justice, about social justice or civil justice or anything like that. Like, they, they're, they're following orders. Yeah. They are. It's, it's weird that people even think that because it's like, you know, local law enforcement and uh, the National Guard, they might not work exactly for the same people, but they do at the same time. It's government. It's and the, the National same. Guard's even more militarized. Yeah, the National Guard works for the federal government. All they care about is keeping the state government, you know, under control, making sure they have it. Because uh, if state government goes, that's a lot. That's the last line of defense between us and them. So they need to make sure that the state government has everything under control. Otherwise, you know, they need to take matters into their own hands. And uh, to kind yeah. of touch on what you said earlier about, I don't agree with. I mean, I, I. I agree with the unrest, but I don't agree. I don't agree with the police, and I don't agree with the protesters because I don't agree that uh, someone should be executed in the street without trial. I also don't agree that when something like this happens, you should be looting and destroying private property of people that had nothing to do with it and who did absolutely nothing to you. I believe that both sides are in the wrong. And uh, this would have been a really good opportunity for them to, for the protesters to voice their opinions and make a difference about things that mattered to them. And instead, they used it as an opportunity to make it about race and to loot businesses and to just basically make, you know, bastardize it and make a mockery of it. And um, all that does is help make the cop, the police, and the government's job easier. You know, the more unruly you act towards people who did nothing to you, the easier it is for the government to quell whatever it is that you're trying to do, because it's unjust. The, so. the more you act like a communist, the more that the government is going to act communist. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The more, the more you do private businesses and destroy private property, the more, the more opportunity you give the government to come in and just destroy you and destroy your your demonstration and it's just sad that yeah. people can't that people just feel like they need to you know you have this perfect opportunity to stand up for what you believe in and instead you make it about looting and theft you know i don't get it yeah. well um but get this though you know we've got um a lot of libertarians in congress like Justin Mosh and Rand Paul and you know a few of the others, they're calling for uh, the demilitarization of the police over this incident. They're saying the police are, are way too militarized. They've got way too powerful of equipment, weapons, all that. They need to demilitarize. Well, I'll guarantee you this. The establishment government who controls everything, they're going to do the exact opposite. They're going to use these riots as an excuse why the police need more military hard war, more military training, more grenade launchers and machine guns, you know. I think that you and I differ, but uh, in the fact that you call it establishment and, you know, the libertarians, you know, the, unfortunately the establishment uses the minarchist libertarians like Amash and Ron Paul. I, but basically, on principle, you and I agree on everything. I'm just saying it's. Yeah. Well, they they do use them when it's convenient for them, you know. Um, especially the libertarians who who run as Republicans, they become in in many cases, mm -hmm. and it's sad, but they become a tool for the neocons yeah. to use against the Democrats, you know. Yes. 
like um like Rand Paul doing that twelve hour filibuster thing. It looked yeah. great for the Republican Party, especially you know the the hardcore neocons that just absolutely hate the Democrats no matter what they do. Even if a Democrat does something right, they still hate them because it's a Democrat doing it. So when you yeah. get somebody like Rand Paul in there making a huge scene and causing the Democrats all this trouble, the neocons cash in on that, you know? So I do agree. Yeah, but you. at the same time, the see, my thing is it's a, it's a big show to me. It, like all of that means nothing because – what is the effect of the state? It grows. It just keeps on growing. Like, my thing is, you know, if you separate the two, the Democrats and the Republicans, consistently, the way, you know, like, you can point at politicians the way, you know, you're doing, yeah. I, I can't do that anymore. I, 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 it doesn't matter to me anymore. But um, you're right. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't agree with it. That's all I'm saying. You're right that you know the nature of the government is to grow. I mean, and yes, and whoever's in power, like right now, the Democrats got the White House, and you know the under Obama, the government grows, and everybody's like, look, Obama's big government. We need a Republican back in office, and they point back to Bush, seeing mm -hmm. look how much better Bush was. Well, look what happened under Bush. The government grew massively. Yeah, you know. And then they're like, well, Bush was bad. Look, you know, Clinton was so much better. Look at Clinton. What happened under Clinton? The government grew massively. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. And so you know, now you look at every single one of them, Bush, Obama, Clinton, all of them. Look at how many. Uh, all throughout history. Look at how many. In it, yeah, all of them. Look at how many innocent people have been murdered because of statism, because of the advancement of government, because of the. Uh, them maintaining or expanding their power. It always results to uh, innocent people being assaulted, extorted, kidnapped, and murdered in this country as well as other countries. So, yeah, I was going to say that goes domestically as well as in foreign wars, you know. And how people yeah. can ignore that and still continue to so support politicians in government is, you know, that's like that thing I was talking about. Uh, I just, I struggle with it because... On one hand, I want to see more libertarians in office because I know that's a step in the right direction. Uh, uh, and on the second hand, I don't want to support government or any of its mechanisms or any of its employees whatsoever or fund them with my taxation. Uh, and as you were saying, some people believe in libertarian politicians as a gateway to anarchism. Some people believe in a violent revolution as a gateway to anarchism. I would like to fall somewhere in between, but I often find myself so I often find myself leaning towards the latter as a violent revolution against the government. Sometimes yeah. I, I feel like the libertarian politicians and that is sort of an ideological gateway to that. But on the other hand, I feel like it's more realistic that a violent revolution will bring about that because that requires no no compromise, no sacrifice, and no legitimizing government. Because even supporting people like Ron Paul and Justin Amash, you're still legitimizing government. By supporting politicians, you're legitimizing politics and government. And that's where I, that's where I struggle with it. Do you mind if I slightly yes. change the subject a little bit? Here? Can, I, can I just put in two cents here? Go ahead, Josh. My thing, my thing is if, if you're going to uh, vote at all, you're supporting your own demise. You're supporting your own evil. You support the fact that the, the state exists because there, there really is no way. If you keep on voting libertarian, let's say let's, let's keep on voting minarchist, then we'll theoretically eventually have a minarchy, a, a republic. But that doesn't lead you to anarchism. You know, if you vote for something, you... you you have a state. It just exists. So, like, um, if and if you're voting for lesser taxes, you're still voting for taxes. If you're if you say yes or no to something, then you want the state to exist because they want you want to have that voice in the public sector. And it, you know the the votes that matter to me exist in the private sector with your money. That that's all I'm saying. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I understand. I understand both of your viewpoints. I'm sure you understand mine too. Yeah, um, I do. 
Uh, I just, I don't really want to change the subject, but it, this reminds me of uh, this argument I've been having on Facebook for like the past week. This argument has been going on. This guy posted a question for me. He says, no libertarian can answer this question. He's been asking this question of libertarians for over two years, and not one of them can answer this question. And his question was, um, say we live in a libertarian society, and there's a bridge that needs repaired, and the repairs cost $500,000. His question was, how many libertarians does it take to fund the repair of that bridge? And of As course, I my said, answer was a mathematical problem without all the variables entered into it. Well, yeah, that's called public work. <laughs> yeah. Well, my answer was simple. My answer was one. Yeah. I mean, say you've got one libertarian who has five hundred thousand dollars. He's willing to drop on that bridge. He's the only one that needs to fund it. He becomes it's owner of the bridge. Right. Yeah. Well, his, he says, well, that's not a valid answer. And I said, okay, then two. He said, well, that's not a valid answer. And he comes up with this, you know, just off-the-wall argument about, you know, a bidding war breaks out, and this guy will pay this much, and this guy will pay that much, and nobody can decide who to fix it. I said, okay, the highest bidder then. And he says, well, then, you know, then then he owns the bridge, and he's a greedy libertarian. He won't let anyone drive on his bridge. I'm like, okay, so he just flushes money down the toilet, and somebody else will build a new bridge. And he's like, oh, so they're just going to get out and just go build a bridge on their own dime, and it doesn't benefit anybody. you know? And this guy, he thinks this is literally an unanswerable, he calls it the libertarian bridge repair conundrum. Uh -huh. like it, and he says it's completely unanswerable. Declares himself to be a genius. Literally, he says that he, quote, uh... He, uh, what was the word he used? He slayed my argument with his natural genius, was his exact word. <laughs> That's funny. And so, but what I was getting at, the reason I brought this up, if, he, if, the, if these people like him really wanted to come up with a conundrum for libertarians, why don't they bring up the topic we're talking about right now? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because this is an actual conundrum. This is where we yeah. disagree and we have an actual you know, literal conundrum about how do we go about this the best way. Well, that would sure. be because uh, libertarians believe in government. They just believe in minimum govern minimal government, whereas anarchists don't. And as anarchists and libertarians could be considered, you know, allies or even close cousins or relatives or whatever you want to call it in the freedom movement, we are not one and the same because anarchists uh, do not, Support government. We don't support government. We don't support rulers in any in any fashion. So um, I would consider libertarians are actually minarchists, not anarchists. See, my view on that, I uh. believe that both anarchists and minarchists, as well as libertarian party officials, there we're all a branch of the same movement, which Agreed. is libertarianism. Yes, yes. anarchy would work. Huh. Sorry, I believe we should work together. I just don't. I don't think that we believe necessarily in the same things. I believe we could work together to to form an alliance. But, um, well, I am an anarchist. I'm not a minarchist. I'm an I'm an anarchist. But I just I believe that right. anarchy is a is a valid means to get to anarchy. To anarchy, it's a gateway. And I, let me specify real quick and say I mean libertarianism. The, the political party, the big L libertarian, not the small L libertarian. The, not the I wouldn't even call them free will. Because I obviously believe in the philosophy of free will. I just don't believe in political parties. See, yeah, I don't believe Thomas, that Thomas. big L are even, even uh, minarchists. Yeah. Thomas, there, there are, um, there is such a thing as a big L and the small L. I'm a small L libertarian. I'm an anarchist, uh, libertarian anarchist, or whatever you want to call it, yeah. or an anarcho-capitalist. They're all the same thing. Yeah. You know, like uh, there's minarchists, and they're libertarian as well, obviously. But yeah, I think we're all libertarian here, in my opinion. Yeah, we're all, it's all a branch of the same philosophy. We're all know? libertarian in philosophy, as in we be believe in free will. We're not libertarian as the political party, where we no. believe in military and police. Right, right.
Yeah, the Libertarian Party actually believes in what I would I would still call it big government. Just they believe in big yeah. government enforcing libertarianism on everything. I would I would no, I would attribute yeah. libertarians basically they're Republicans. They just uh, believe a little bit less, as in they don't want abortion. They don't want laws about abortion and shit. Yeah, they're they're more socially liberal, but they're yeah. they're like Republicans, but they're socially liberal Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. But well, yeah, that's that's still big government. In, but that's also like the same thing like uh, big C, yeah, little C, right. capitalism, and that sort of thing, where two different words mean this mean two words that are the same word, but they mean two different things depending on the context, that sort of thing. But yeah, we're all anarchists here, as we believe in no rulers, no government, but voluntary association. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I'm not a libertarian party member, um, and I'm not a minarchist. Yeah, I'm no. a minarchist, but I believe in minarchy as, like you said, as a gateway to anarchy. No, I know neither one of you. I know you guys are both anarchists. I know just by talking to you and your, and your philosophies that that's what you guys believe in. So I didn't want your viewers to confuse me for one of those, you know. Yeah, no. But, um, All right. Well, uh, I think this is a good time to stop, if you don't mind. Yeah. Is that it's a good? Was a good show, guys. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah, was. yeah, thanks everybody for watching and uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, this will air on uh, at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, YouTube.com/user/voluntaryvirtues. And thank you, Michael Shanklin, for that, of course. And thank you both. And uh, thanks for coming on, Corey. It was good to meet you. Yep, it was nice, nice, uh, nice all talking right. to you. Nice debate we had. I'll be sharing this video with all my friends too. Cool, man. It's on. Awesome. Yeah, we need to share this. We need more viewers on this show. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, take care, everybody. Yeah.